have restorative consumables. So that's also going to be small. So most of the drugs are going to be using tomorrow. Um, with the units themselves, they're adjustable, but they're kind of difficult to adjust. So if you need if you need a lowered raise, anything, just raise your hand, and one of us will come by and we'll adjust the uh, the actual model itself for you, so it's a kind of more comfortable height. Um, as you can see in front of you, you've got your blue surgical kit. You've got in your in your blue. Uh, box with a clear lid that will have some of the items that you're going to be your implants that you'll be placing, and some of the other items you'll need, and then you also have your Miltex tray that will have your instrumentation. Um, again, my name is Nick, so if you guys need anything, just raise a hand or yell out my name, and either I or one of the uh, reps will be able to help you. Just go over some of the instruments we're going to use and, and make sure everybody has them. You should have a needle driver, a mirror, a burial probe. Now this is a clear uh, tissue elevator. I, I personally use a number nine tissue elevator because the number nine has pointed in on one side and around on the other, and I use the point quite a bit. So I'll explain that when I'm doing my flat. But this is a rear. Now the knife blade, this is really important. Get a round knife blade. You have infinite control. A flat knife blade, it's, uh, it doesn't work as well as the posterior, especially. And when you're designing your flaps around nice play, it gives you lots of control. This is called a seagull handle. Now, I'm going to give you lots of little pearls on things that I use that aren't in this kit. And I get everything from uh, uh, Salvin Dental. Yeah. You call Salvin Dental, have them send you an implant catalog. Lots of little toys and trinkets like in there. That is the DR gadget piece myself. So. There's lots of gadgets you can use. Uh, tissue forceps and, and, and scissors. Now these are these are not suture scissors, and you wouldn't want to use those for suture, but they'll work. The second set of trays, Minnesota retractor. I always, I have these put up separate in my office in case I need them, so, so you can measure the distance between implants or your whole depth. So basically that's your instrument setup and everybody should have all those instruments. Now let's go to the Zimmer tray itself. Now most of you have put some Zimmers or been to the first course, so I'll go through this pretty fast. the Lindemann burr. Very helpful. Pick that up from Salvin. The burr that I use the most in my kit that's not furnished by Zimmer. No. This is called a PowerPoint and it comes in several lengths. They're pretty expensive. It's a hundred bucks for two of them. But they, they will go through the densest bone or thin bone either way. So this gives you an excellent start. I would definitely invest in these birds. 
What is it again? It's called a PowerPoint burr sold by uh, Salvin Gentleman. PowerPoint. Okay, so now we're going to look. We're going to, on our first case, we're going to place a green implant, a 3.7. So you look at your, your drill bits. We'll start with the pilot, and then we'll go with the green color, the solid green one. We'll go to the next, the 2.8, which is the dotted. Now, if you have extremely soft foam, you can stop at the dotted. But generally, you go up to the solid green line, and that will be your last burr for that color of implant, the 3.7 in this case. If you go on down to the, to the 4.1, you use these two. And if you go to the purple, which as we go through there, we'll talk about the order you go in. But one thing, these dotted lines are a little bit deceiving because the softest foam in the posterior maxilla generally still has a hard cortex. So I almost always go to the final burr, at least through the cortex. Maybe not to the length of the, of the osteotomy, but I will go through the cortex. When we go down through here, these four little parallel pins are definitely your friend. <laughs> okay, you'll use them. I use them on every single case, and like I said, I've been doing this for 30 years. Don't get overconfident. If you look at them, they have a little hole in them. That hole is designed for a piece of floss, so if you drop it, you can recover it. So if you drop it and they swallow it, just be prepared that you didn't, if you didn't have floss on it. I don't use floss on it, and I've got, I, when we talk about complications, I've got some complications I'll show you if you don't, but it, 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 that's what that's designed for. So then we've got some foam taps. If you have really dense foam, you'll want, you can tap it with a hand tap. It's extremely rare that I use this, but the zimmers are, are designed with a carrier that has a shear strength less than the collar of the implant. So it, they're going to prevent you from making a stupid mistake of over torquing that implant and putting it in. And then the drivers, we'll go through all the drivers as we use them in the individual cases. Now this is a ratchet, we'll, we'll use the ratchet and we'll use the hand driver. The hand driver can get you in a lot of trouble, but the hand driver is much easier to use. You can over torque it. So as I go through there, then we'll, we'll talk about it a little more. One thing that, that is imperative on your setup that, uh, again, I get from Salvin, this is called the rapid roll. It's like a giant condom. You put it over your handpiece, it takes just your handpiece and runs the entire length of your, all your cords. Everything's covered. So invest in that. Rapid roll. Any questions on the initial instrumentation? Does everyone have all those instruments? Everyone good? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> you can use that one. All right, well, we're going to start with the first patient. And I'll just, we'll just do a brief history of what Zimmer publishes about theirs. If you want. Uh, Dr. Downs has put the x-ray up. And Zimmer uh, says this is a 31-year-old male who's been a construction worker and now is going to go to sales and wants to get his teeth. In the past, he's just had his teeth extracted. Now he wants to replace them. His health and history, uh, he's had no general anesthetics, no hospitalizations, drinks a few beers a uh, week and smokes a pack a day. He's allergic to penicillin, no serious illnesses. Vital signs, 125 over 78, pulse was 78. And then the missing teeth that show on the film. Now, if this case walks in your office, I mean, this is like the perfect case. And obviously you're hardly able to see this, but Good. for training purposes, this is a great case. So what we're gonna do today, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna put in a simple one tooth implant in the number in the number five position. We're going to do this with a punch. Now, it's not with with the advent of, of 3D imagery, you can predict when you can use a punch more. But don't get fooled on a punch because that bone does funny things under that tissue, and that tissue could be a lot thicker than you than you think it is. So. 
Oftentimes, if I'm going to use a punch, after I anesthetize, I actually sound the bone as I'm anesthetizing. Okay? I'll sound it with the needle. Now, briefly talking about anesthesia, in the maxilla, I use exclusively a 30 gauge needle and septic cane. Okay? In the mandible, I'll use a 27 gauge long and, and dial cane. I don't block with septic cane. That's a personal preference. But just remember, you can't aspirate with a 30, and septic cane's 100% stronger than lidocaine. Okay? Remember that. That's why it takes so little septic cane. It, it can get you in trouble. It just, I mean, it's a great drug, but use it sparingly. All right. So we're going to do number five. We're going to do a punch technique. Punch. In this case, we'll, we, we sound the bone. We know we got a nice wide ridge. The punch, uh, we'll use the, the closest size to the implant size we can. We're going to put a 3.7 implant in. We're going to put the implant and we're going to do an initial tissue. We're going to put the tissue former in. So while I'm setting up, if you guys want to start, pull out your 3.7 by 13 implant, pull out your 4 millimeter punch. On the top left side, you should have a tissue forming. You can pull that out. Tissue forming? Depending on what kind of bone you're in and your amount of experience, you can set your motor at a certain speed. When I'm in really soft bone and I'm close to something I don't want to be close to, I can drop my motor down to 800. Today we're going to cut 1200. That, it, 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 that's a routine, that's a good safe speed. The number one thing that's going to cause immediate failure in these implants is overheating the bone. Number one, guaranteed. So the assistants in here, listen, if you don't have internally ir irrigated birds, you've got to keep that the smoke down. If you see smoke, that implant's going to fail. I personally, I, I don't use internally irrigated, I use externally irrigated, but that's just a personal preference. The internal irrigation is obviously it, it's easier for the operator. Okay, now, these, these heads, obviously, they open a little wider. They've got a little hypermobile TMJ. The kind of position them. see on the monitor, we're going to put one at number five. Now this is the ideal situation. You've got, you've got teeth adjacent. You look at your film, and your film shows that the roots of, of the adjacent teeth are not divergent. That's really important on a single tooth implant. You look at the roots of the tooth next to it. If they're divergent to the, to the empty space, be careful. I can tell you that I have clipped in the adjacent tooth root at one point. It happened. I can also tell you that all of you are going to make a mistake and there's going to, you're going to put implants in that you wish you had back. To, to this day, I mean, I, I, there's still occasion I put one in I wish I had back. Just be prepared to stand behind your work and correct it. Okay, so I know my first fur in this case is going to be the little gold punch. Now, when you insert these furs, 
If you just twist them until they fall in, and then to release them, you push the button behind. Can everybody still hear me in the back all right? Yeah. I've got my mic. Now, I'll basically just talk to this just exactly the way I was doing my office. I have to set up. We've anesthetized with, with uh, separate cane, and I'm going to use a punch. Now, this is a little... This is a little four millimeter punch. The problem with these are those short shafts. Uh, I I use the short shaft, and I also use the true box. He punches a lot in my office, and these are long shafts, and you can break the handle off. So you get more control with the with the long shaft than you do the short shaft, because the short shaft is a lot cheaper to buy. So with the, with the roots. We know that our, the roots are good on the x-ray. We got the, we can center the punch between the teeth. Now, if you're going to err with your punch, using a punch is like using a guide. This is like it's, it's the easiest way to do it ever. You use your punch, you center your punch between the teeth. Your assistants can really help you on this uh, on your parallelism throughout the entire drilling process. As the assistant looks in their angle. Always talk to them preoccupied about what they're looking for. So we're going to look and we're going to center this punch between the teeth. If you're going to air a buckle and lingual, always air a little to the lingual. Give yourself a little room on the buckle. Now, when you, when you use a tissue punch, as with a scalpel, first time you go through the periosteum, one, one swipe. All right, so we're going to make our punch. Uh, I usually use a small rongeur to remove the punch. In this case, I use the tissue forceps. Now I'm using my uh, little brass pilot bird. We're going to look at anterior posterior parallelism. We're going to look at buccolingual parallelism. And we know that we're putting in at least a 10 millimeter. Our pre-op actually shows we're going to put in a 13. This thing's guarded to 10, so you can sink this to the hub. So, so. I've made my initial hole with the brass, and then the next hole we're going to use the 2.3, and I use the I, I use the long shake as often as I can because the longer the drill, the more it's going to show you your on uh, your parallelism. Now these drills are all marked, and the first mark is eight millimeters, and then, and then 10, 11 and a half, 13, and 15. It's extremely rare that I put a 15 millimeter implant in, but sometimes you've got enough foam for that. So now we're going to, I've got my pilot hole down to 10. We're going to take this down to 13 millimeters on, on our first drill. So again, we're going to look at our anterior posterior parallelism. We're going to look at our buccal lingual. We're going to take this down to 13. And notice the tip. If you think you're tipping easily or distally, look at it at different angles. Okay? So, after that first drill, before I get any bigger at all, I'm going to take my parallel pin. I said I use these on every case I do. On this case, I'll use the thin edge and not the marked edge. 
Now, a lot of guys will use the furrer for their x-ray. I use the parallel pin. I'll take the, take the narrow end of the parallel pin and stick it in the hole. And I look, and, and right off the bat, I see that my parallel pin is just a little bit to the mesial. Can you see that? My pin's not exactly parallel between the teeth. So now's the time to make correction. On my next burr, I'm going to stand this thing up just a little bit. So now I'm using my 2.8 burr, and we're going to correct it, correct our hole as we go down through there just a little bit. To consciously try and straighten that up because it's just a uh, uh, lever putting that in that you're going to um, end up measly. So be conscious of that and push that uh, uh, burr a little straighter as you go. So I've, I've corrected my problem. Now, if, there, if there's any worry about anatomy, sinus, or nerve, at this point you can put your, your parallel pin in and take an x-ray. Take a little periapical, shoot a periapical, and see exactly where you're going. It gives you some uh, distance between the roots, and it also gives you the distance to the, uh, the anatomy you don't want to hit. All right, I'm taking my last fur here. All right, so I finished my 3-4 burr. Now, on the implant, they come in this case. These are obviously not sterile on the, ex on the outside. Have your assistant open it. I, I have sterile towels on my trays. You drop it on the tray. With your, with your sterile gloves on, you can pop it open. This is the implant and screws inside the cap. On anterior cases, on anterior cases, I'll use a hand driver. We'll attach the hand driver to the implant. It has a little, it has a little seat that holds the implant in there. And now we're going to irrigate this implant as we put it in. Hopefully you've got some bleeding, which is good irrigation, but if you don't, make sure you put some water on it. You want these cases to bleed. Everybody has, has wants bloodless cases, but the more bleeding you have, the better healing you have. So we're going to put this in. As we're putting this in, we're actually conditioning the bone because the implant is a little bigger than the hole. So I put it in, and I wait, and I let that bone condense. Then I put it in a couple more turns and I wait. Now, when I'm using this hand driver, I'm only using my fingertips. Don't ever grip the hand driver like a screwdriver. Just use your fingertips. So we're going to drive it in. Now on this one, we're going to put the tissue former right on it. On the right, bottom right row of your uh, kit is our, our screwdrivers. We're going to remove the impression post, which comes with the implant. This green part is your impression post, so you save that in the patient's chart. And now we're going to place the, the tissue former. And that one is done. Now I'll walk around and, then, and John and, and Dr. Downs will walk around and we'll all kind of try to help you out.
Some of the instrumentation, like for the drivers, you feel in, in your office, they think these things really snap together, but you tend to be over and over, some of them are not as tight. Yes, okay. Right. Okay. Pretty good Okay, uh, what I want to the Ankylos users in the room, you're used to seating these uh, and, and driving these subcortical, is that correct? Yeah. And so on the Zimmer system, as you can see, there is a machine collar at the top. And here's the, here's the beauty about this system, why I'm liking this, particularly in the posterior, is that sometimes you don't have the room to, to go subcortical. So you measure out 10, 11 millimeters, and you know you gotta go 12, and you're, you're sitting right on the IA on that. On the Zimmer system, Jim, is that you have the variation now. You have a millimeter of a machine collar. That can be the surface contact to the gingival cup, or you can put it at the, ging at the, at the, uh, the crest of the bone. But this system is not to be submerged. Does that make sense? So you've got a play. You have a play in the system of about one millimeter. So sometimes you get in there and you and you take your verification film and you see that you're about oh you're about a millimeter from the IA, good safe distance. But then you look and you're like, well, I'm just about only half a millimeter under the crest of the gingival uh, margin. That's okay. Leave it. It's designed for that. All right? Because I, I notice a lot of you, uh, Anklos, you, you want to sink this one. Do not sink this system. Cresto height or above. Now remember, the only thing in the, in the math, in the math of measuring for your, your implant, remember to always measure, you, you punch through that gingival cup, measure the cup, right there, measure the cup, say it's two millimeters, you're putting in an 11.5, that means you've got to go to what mark on your drill? At least 13, right? Eyeballing it to almost 13. So remember to do the math. Do the math. Good if you bottom out these implants, they're going to start to spin on you. So you want to make sure your hole is deep enough. And most of the time, I'll actually drill my hole a half a millimeter, maybe even a millimeter longer, to decrease the hydraulic pressure when I'm putting it in. Okay. So if you bottom out and you spin the implant, it's just spinning in there. Take it out and graft it, and call it good. Or, or put a bigger implant in. Oh, 
Are you a zoomer guy? Sam. Well, I'm not a rep. Okay. I have a rep for you. It sounds like you have a procedural question. Actually, no, I don't have a procedural question. I have a marking question. Yes, sir. I can help you with that. Okay, so if I, what I remember from the last class is 8, 10, 13, 16? Uh, you're on the short bird. Yeah. So you're actually on just 8 and 10. Okay. So if you look at your long bird here, because we're placing one of the Right, we're putting a 13. Yeah, so you want to stick to this back row of uh -huh. okay. here. Okay, so if you look at this, uh, now it's time to get actually going to work through the bars. The implants okay. the way they're sorry, yeah. different packs. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. 8, 10, yeah. and a half. Yeah. 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 Okay. So that's that top, yeah. and then the bottom uh, line is 16. Well, I'm putting you in. Stay away from that bottom line. Why is it your slide? 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 It's because we want to avoid the red. Yeah, you don't want the red. That's we don't sure want the red. I don't like red when we don't want the red. You can do it. Yeah. These, these three tools are the tools that are used to place it. This one goes in the headpiece. So you can, you can actually place it with the headpiece if you prefer. Um, or I think it's on black. Oh, the same with this. Yeah, so with this. Uh, you know, I, I just had to kind of recall the. This particular one, this will fit directly. What do you call it? The size uh, or this insert. And I would tell you, we're we're feeling like there's some hard cancellous bone down there. And these have through. these have kind of a spring loaded, so that they go retain pretty well. And so. Because, you know, if you notice the final width that you drill it to is 3.4, it's 3.7, so it's a little bit wider okay. on, on purpose, so it will be able to compress. So his kind of technique is to do a turn, wait a second, do a turn, wait a second. These the carriers, the the so, yeah. when you get your implant in, sometimes they'll feel a little loose. You notice it's true on the carriers, the implant's not loose. And you, these, these carriers are flat on one side and round on the other. You can use the flat side to do that. To leave that the flat side. Yeah. Yeah, either one. There's two. There's two. The one right here. One there. And one there. One there. The distance. Yeah, that's, I mean. This technique, if it, if it gets pretty snug, he'll, he'll turn it like that, you know, the way he just comes in and turn it, you know, just to allow the bone to press. I didn't get a great comment. Yeah, good question. It's Dr. Said, easy it's only that easy. It's, it's all about case selection. It can be yeah, that depending easy. Depending on how you measure this tissue, you know, how you pick the right case for your first few cases, it is going to be this easy. Right where the implant meets the yeah. Pick and choose, take the cherries, refer to everything else. Exactly. So the way you'll know is this. What's that address in Nebraska? Right that is true. So chances are if this t-shirt is you'll that shelf shoulder will be right at the same level. So you've got you've got a ways to go. Okay. So he's young Instrumentation. Yeah, so that kind of gives you a feel. They get they get really snug, which is which is good. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, because that's you know going off the fact that the tissue is about two millimeters. Yeah. If we reflect the flap, which we'll do later, you'll be able to see the bone, and you just make sure that that. Right in, right in. Uh, Driver here. Insert, let yeah. the bone expand. Insert, let the bone yeah, this, expand. This, 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 Insert, let the bone expand. Insert, let the bone expand. Yeah, it's it, 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 it,
A lot of, I've heard some questions about placing the implant using the, the motorized driver. These implants, as with, as with all surgery, it's all about tactile sense. Once you put a motorized instrument between you and your hand, you lose your tactile sense. I always place them by hand. I'll, I did this one by the hand driver. I'll do the next one by the ratchet and show you. But I always want to feel the torque on the implant. I don't want the machine to tell me where it's at. Right. Okay. To get that off, you, then you drop down to this final row. Right. You have the driver. The implant at certain, you just don't want to open it. It gives you that. Right here. Uh, yeah. so I'll, 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 so this is here. Um, so this right. is a longer. So you don't need it. Yeah, you don't, you don't exactly. need to use a torque wrench. You do not need to use a torque wrench to put these in. I asked if somebody said about a certain new centimeter on the short and hip plane. Zimmer built that in as a green <laughs> carrier or the purple carrier, whatever carrier you've got, because this pot metal is going to shear a certain. You're not going to over torque that in place. Okay, I want you. To, I think everyone got their their implant in. Yeah. No red lights. No red lights. If you get a red light, I want you to raise your hand. We want to get a picture of you next to your mannequin. <laughs> All right, I want to draw your attention to the monitor in front of you, and let's look at the implant. Okay, we'll wait just to give them a couple more minutes. So we'll go over the questions about the implant and the measurements. Very important. This one's probably a little bit too tall for the case. But, and then this is how the patient feels. You just hand tighten it, and then you'll let the patient know if, 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 they, if that ever goes loose, have to come in and flat You don't want to torque it. You don't want to torque that, but you just want to hand tighten it at the day of surgery. You know, ideally, as far as these are available, so you want it just, to, just above the tissue, but not 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 shallow enough to where the tissue will grow. Yeah, this one's probably a little bit too tall. Yeah, exactly. Perfect. If, it, if it's too tall, then they could technically be chewing on it. You know, it's so, yeah, exactly, exactly. Immediate function right there. What's that? Immediate function. Exactly. Now, wait, let me ask you a question. Yeah. As I'm, as I'm wrenching this on down, when it seats on the bone, it's going to stop. Um, no, you, because when you, when when the when it's drilled, yeah. um, when your osteotomy is drilled, right. it's technically a little bit deeper than the implant itself. Okay. So you don't want to just go because and, and the fact that they're self-tapping it sometimes there's voids in the bone. Yeah. So you could you could you could drive it pretty deep without real. So you want to make sure that you're, you're not going too deep. Yeah, exactly. Now, on, on this, it's, when, when you use a tissue punch, yep. it's, it's a little bit challenging because you can't see the bone. Right, right. right. But on that... Got about a millimeter and a half or so. <laughs> yeah, on that hard. implant, I'll open this one up real quick okay. so you can see the... Uh, this particular part, you know, so in a perfect world, obviously, right where the implant meets the, the color part, right. that's bone level. Right? Okay, so... So, now this, what's a handy little trick is this... To this shoulder yep. right here, that's two millimeters from the top of the implant. Okay. So if this if this uh, tissue is two millimeters, you could place all the way to that point. to that and, and have this be right at the tissue. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, that, so you, yeah, that's so a little you, bit of a that's a little trick. And then um, one one thing I want to show you too with the with that ratchet that you were just using. Okay, I had a yeah. question about using a laser instead of a punch. Obviously, yeah. so you that that ratchet you're using. Laser, you're you oh yeah, right there. So you notice if, if you, laser, you, you have the flexibility to go right on there, yeah. right, you, more than likely you'll start to run into teeth. Yeah. Uh, so there's extended. So yeah, this, these three parts here are, can we'll use. This one goes in the handpiece if you ever want to right. place it with the handpiece. And then this one will go in that ratchet. So that goes into, into the green thing there. I want to go yeah. over... Uh, exactly. So do you think that'll clean? I've driven this too far, or is that just about right? Real quick. Um, 
Yeah, it's, 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 I think we have the flexibility. So that one done back yeah, there? Probably just a little bit too far. King, you done? Far deep when you, when you so, all right, back, front sit down. Uh, I wouldn't, uh, <laughs> if this was... Okay, everyone look at the monitor. You don't want to back Let's look at the actual implants. Because I want to, if we keep asking about this collar, okay? The uh, the machine collar, you can see it's about a millimeter in the height. So the question is, do you go sub cortically with this implant system? The answer is no. So either take it to the, the actual uh, cortical height, the bone level, bone level, it's called, or slightly above. That's the beauty of this machine color. A lot of cases where I've gotten in the back and I, I'm putting in a, I'm thinking I can go with a, a 10. I, I take my x-ray at a certain point. I don't drive it all the way down. I always leave it about a millimeter shy. I take my verifying x-ray, S on, okay? And then I say, oh, wow, I only got another millimeter to that, to the, to a anatomical danger place. Great, where am I? I look in the mouth and I'm about half a millimeter underneath the gum level. I stop. This system gives you that variation. I like that flexibility. Where before, if I went back there with the system that said I have to be subcortically placed, I'm SOL. All right? So, there's the beauty in, the, in some flexibility in the system. Now, uh, also about the drill, you were talking about the, uh, the sensitivity, right, Dylan? If you were to take this and drive it in with a handpiece, you have no control. You have no control, Jeremy. You don't, you don't know what it feels like, okay? So I think this video will capture what we're talking about here. He has no idea. He's, he's going to use the drill. He can't feel anything. Look, he's going to push real hard. He can't feel anything. He can't control it. And there he goes to the sinus. And okay, reverse. Always remember, reverse. <laughs> I notice on some of you, you're pushing at the top of the drill. When I come around, I, I'm going to reposition your hands. I want you to start using two-hand technique. Hold the side. Hold the side so you can feel that. Until you, you, get, you guys are just one-handed. This You have no control, no idea. Okay? So Let the drill bit do the work. Don't push on the end of the, oh, the, end of the drill in the back. For more pressure. Let the drill bit do the work so you don't overheat. Now watch the video again. This is kind of what we did. Now this is a flap technique versus the punch. And when we go to the lower, this is what the Bill's going to show you on using the flap. Yeah, someone's car alarm. It'd be nice if it elevated that nice. <laughs> it These models do have periosteum underneath the gum line. So look for it. It's very thin. Okay, look for it. They're going through the they're gonna go through all the process. And then again, let's let's talk about the first. Dale, what's the first line measurement? Hey, Alan, what's the second one? No. Ten. You're thinking ankles. Jeff, what's the third one? Eleven and a half. What's the next one, King? Thirteen. Thirteen. And what's the last one, Jose? Sixteen. Sixteen. All right. Good. So just remember, it's just a new system. It's just, it's just a little different. These pins are not calibrating pins. See the little notches on them? Okay, in your other system, in the Ankylos, you have one that has that little calibrations on it, has the marks on it, the actual measurement marks. I think that's a good idea. No one asked Bill about, okay, what do you do here when you take your x-ray? What do you put in there to use? What do you think you're going to have to use here? 
can use your drill. The drill has the marks. The only thing here is that you have to pull it off your, your, uh, yeah, your driver, or your handpiece. So, I have a little tip for you. What I've done with this particular system, um, some of these birds, like the first three set, or first three in the set, are always going to go n uh, dull on you, and you're going to replace these the most often. I keep those, and then what I did is I cut off the latch. Cut off the latch, part of it, and that's now my, my measure guide. Okay, just keep it in the kit. We keep it in the kit. It goes through sterilization, but it's got the marks on it, King. Eight, ten, eleven and a half. Okay, ready? All together, ready? Eight, Eight ten, 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 eleven, 11 and a half, half, thirteen, sixteen. 16. Okay. Gosh, they got it, Bill. Okay, you guys ready for round two? Bring it on. Any questions on that last case? What if you go subcrestal with your implant a little bit? In this, if you're putting the tissue former on, it's not the end of the world. If you're burying it, then you're not going to find it. I, I like it when I bury mine, like in this next case, we're going to bury it. I like to leave it just a hair above the bone because when you take the tissue punch, and get it, it'll go right over the implant, and you'll find it, and you won't be removing excess tissue. If you bury it too deep, you'll just have a hard time finding it. But in this case, you put the tissue former on right away, what you're going to do is get a little bone die back. Okay. And then one last thing, on this next case, when you go, everyone, this time, when you go starting driving in the implant itself with the carrier, all right, I want you to stop, and where you see the implant collar above the gum line, stop, take the carrier off. Because in the real world, this system, man, when it bites in, who's been doing, doing zimmers? Raise your hand. You, you've done some of that? Yeah? You feel it really bite in, don't, don't you? Okay? And if you don't take that carrier off, it's going to wedge on there. So take it off, and then have the direct drive, the big guy that goes right into the implant. You have much more control. Then you can see better. Okay, Greg? Okay. Ready? We can switch it back. Excuse me? Uh, I haven't seen any red lights yet. <laughs> You're still going green. Yeah. If I, if I saw right. Everyone get their phone like you show in that pan on every patient, you know, they wouldn't get many referred out. <laughs> However, they I usually use don't have that kind of a 15 blade. There's lots of blade options you can use, but I just try to keep everything as inexpensive and uniform as possible. Okay, we're going to do number 30. What size so implant? I draw okay. on here for a flat design. Now, you can use a, a, a lingual release or a buckle release. Either one. Else just, I can put if on you, YouTube if you release it from the lingual and slap it to the buckle, it's just much easier to use the operator to hold. Yeah. So that's what we're going to do. <laughs> How I spent my weekend away from the office. Give yourself plenty of release, plenty of retraction. The thing on all surgery that causes the most inflammation, whether it's thermal removal or implant placement, is flap retraction. If you got your assistant sitting there just holding that cheek back when you're taking that third molar out, she's causing more trauma than you are drilling that th hole in the bone. So the, the inflammation and the swelling it mostly comes from retraction. So try to keep that in mind. If you have a nice, big, loose flap, it takes fingertips to hold it in place. Okay. If you make a little flap, you've got to hold it out of the way. You're pulling against all that musculature and, and all the periosteal attachment. So, a round blade, a round blade holder, it gives you infinite control, lots of pressure. When you make a flap, use lots of downward pressure. Keep your blade perpendicular to the bone. Go through the periosteum one swipe. You don't want to go in there and cut in size and in size and have to incise again. Number one, it's a waste of time, and number two, it causes more trauma. So we're going to go in there. We're going to make our lingual first. I go down to the bone. 
We're going to come around the meso of the molar or the bicuspid, whichever we want to do first, doesn't matter. And to carry it down into the vestibule. Now, you, you, we're, not, we're not in an acidic zone here. If you make that flap an inch long, it's not going to make any difference. A one inch flap heals just as fast as a three millimeter flap. The tissue just has to heal. So now we're going to use, this is a freer, as I said, I, I prefer a number nine. If I can get my big hands out of the way. So we're going to retract our flap. And then I'll use a Minnesota retractor. And the Minnesota retractor, the end of it, purchases on foam. The, the tissue, the retractor never needs to be on soft tissue. That causes inflammation, causes post-op pain. You purchase the retractor on the bone. Okay. So, if you want to measure, this is the ideal time if you're, if you're concerned about your distance. When you're just putting one implant between two teeth, and you generally, if the root structure on the film supports it, you center the implant. If you need to measure the distance, you can measure the distance and then, and then, and then put a purchase point in the bone. In the beginning, you may want to do that. As you do a few, then you'll get away from that. So once again, I know that in this case, I'm putting a 6.0 by 13 in. So I'm going to use my little brass pilot burr just to get my hole in my direction. I've got my flap retracted. centered between the molar and the bicuspid. And now remember, on a human, that mylohyoid ridge runs underneath these molars. Stick your finger in there and make sure you don't have a huge undercut because if you don't have an eye cat, you can easily perk the, uh, the lingual plate if they've got a big mylohyoid ridge. It looks like you can hold this six millimeter implant just great but it may just scoop right in. So physically palpate it when you do your exam, when you're doing your pre-op for the implant. If there's any questions, scan them. So we know this one has a nice, thick, straight ridge. Go ahead, John. Something I learned from you, too, is uh, as you go in your drill series, uh, you can put your finger in there, and if you feel the vibration, you might need to reassess uh, where you're at. Right, and we'll, and we'll use that technique when we do an anterior. Your flaps are too short. Make them longer onto the buckle. I'm watching, looking, you guys are, you're not, you're not, you're not going to be able to reflect that. Also, the other consideration here is uh, if that mucogingival junction comes up high sometimes into that ponic area, then take your, make your incision more to the lingual versus the mid crest. So you can reposition some some tissue and get some uh, keratinized gingiva. <coughs> now, on these posterior teeth, in the, in the human with the, with the mouth that can't open more than 35 millimeters, you're going to have to use a short fur. I prefer the longer one, like I said, but we'll use a short one. So, we're going to put a yellow implant in, a six millimeter. So look at your yellow, your yellow lines on your tray. We used a 2.3, and it would go immediately to a 3.4. A lot of you are not through the periosteum. If you see yellow, that's periosteum. Oh, you're good. Yeah, get that scalpel cut through that periosteum. All right, after I get my 3.4, I take my parallel pin. I put that in, I check my parallel. Once again, I see that I'm a little bit mesial or distal, so I'm a little bit to the uh, distal. So I'm going to correct that with the next bird. One little thing I want you to all remember. One of the one of the 
ladies asked me a minute ago, well, I'm, I know I'm a millimeter off this way. I wrote about my impression. The worst enemy of good is better. <laughs> if it's good enough, you know, don't try to make it better in a certain situation. If you know you can restore it, then you, if you make it better, you're going to blow out someplace, almost guaranteed. So now I'm going to my next purple burrow, or my next yellow burr, I'm sorry. It's a 4.4. Slow down, Bill. We got them all still punching through. Okay. Not through the periosteum. Okay. There you go. See how you see the area? Let's get your punch through. Maybe a little. So it's blinking, so it's in reverse. Okay. Uh, the M for motion. Yeah. That, that we're getting. Uh, that the, these two buttons are if you want to use um, these tools to place the implant. Um, so we'll switch it back over there. And then see how, see how those are in there? It's always a good idea to put them up like that. Then you can see what the tool is. Because when they're both like that, yeah, exactly. So. Now on this lower, here's the thing, uh, and Bill maybe just talked about it. You have to tip towards the lingual, so on a buccal lingual tip, cheeks are tipping towards the lingual. The bone actually goes to the buccal. And you always have to palpate for that myohyoid ridge in there, because it's going to dive underneath. And the worst thing you can do is perforate that lingual wall. Tomorrow afternoon we'll show you some if cases really you don't want to have there, but we'll lower mandible will probably go all the way there. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's a six six millimeter. Because if you see if you see that wow, it really does pitch in. Ross can help you upright that. And it's not much of an angle, maybe fifteen degrees or ten degrees, but it's better than perforating that leg of a wall. The resultant pattern of the mandible is down and out. The resultant pattern of the maxilla is up and back. So remember that. There's a lot of plumbing down there, and that's why you want to avoid that bring in the wall. That bone is going out. Okay, we're going to fix this bone. Six by thirteen. Six by thirteen. Yeah. On these big implants now, you want to use both yellow birds, the 5-1 and the 5-7. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's their own tendency. They're going to want to put that look at what your eyes looking at. But then, Now I'm going to put this implant in and I'm going to leave it at the at white stage and then we'll talk before we go any further. Look at the size, is that what the crack? And you know it's going to be, yeah, see how I'm going this direction. We're going to use the hand ratchet on this. The hand ratchet snaps right on the implant right there. there. It holds it in there. I like to put my finger on top of that to stabilize it and get it started. Same thing, as you're putting it in, you let it condense. Put it in a couple turns, let it condense, put it in a couple turns, let it condense. And we're going to go to uh, 13 here. 13 is going to go. Yeah. 
And because you can see directly, mm -hmm. you can see directly the bone, you put it right at the head. So because you can see directly, put it just shy of the crest of the bone. Don't drive it below the bone. Sometimes you encounter a bone that's pretty thick. Pump the pump the drill. Just lift it up and down, just a teeny bit, and that gets a little water flow under it and pops up any any uh, particular bone. That's what happens in the real world. Take your x-ray, you check where you're at. 
you know, it could be some a little innovation there that you get into if you want to stay out. You may not get a full paresthesia, a full anesthesia, but you might get a paresthesia because of it. So I use low bone for that reason. That's a bad idea. That's why you gotta have to look at these two angles. Sometimes on these patients, when I do this, yeah. I stand up to do this one because I can look straight in like this. Well, you know, it's when I'm doing stuff with my assistant sitting over there. I also, you know, angulation things. I say, what do you think? You know, always. You know, because the assistant's seeing things from a you know 180 degree view differently. I will say the one thing I really don't like about these drills is that it's marking when it's moving. I would tell you they just not quite as evident. Okay, I meant to be yellow, so now I can blow it out. Yeah. Put it in place. 
Did you all have those when you were in Devil Yep. It's a hard habit to break after you've been blowing on things for two years. I, I think I even did it once the first couple of weeks. Goes back. Oh, too late. We blow on this. Get to six zero yet? Yeah, I was well. It's the yellow solid way up here. Oh, oh. Okay. You gotta keep going. Okay. I guess I'm not paying attention there. You gotta get way up here. Okay. Keep going. You know, keep, one keep one thing I didn't remember from last time, and maybe I don't know. What is our criteria for width? Do we want it how close to the bucket plate and to the laser plate do we want to get with an implant? We got it. We're going to give you all those specifics. Okay. I mean, I know length, you kind of want to come close to max it, but... Your tendency is still want to... Go there. These are just when you get it to the strange here, yeah. it's just all that stuff. It's like the yeah. final file at the end of it. You yeah. have the crown yeah. down, yeah. you're just <laughs> large and you're not. What do you think you're implanting? When you're flat, you can get it under. And everybody who's got a gun will show it up. So, was that one short for the basic for you? Oh, it's just short. Okay. Yeah.
What does that mean? I got a little red light there. It just means that the nerves are a little close. Got a little bit to the lingual. Yeah, that's what Jim was saying that uh, I need to think about a 10 to 15 degree angle from the get go and maybe bring it a little bit more to the buckle. Right. <laughs> Is everyone getting ready to suture? No. Okay, everyone's ready. I think we, we're catching everyone up. So, you know, we got some white belts, green belts, black belts. All right, king stripes. Am I on? Back on. Okay, now, a couple of things. Some of the reps are showing you the, the length guards, the full guards, the stops. I intentionally didn't pull those out because I don't want any crutches in here. If you're going to make mistakes, this is the place to make mistakes. If you feel like after you, you develop some ta I want you to develop tactile sense, that's what it's all about. How to control the depth of that fur, even in soft bones, don't let it go too deep. If you put these fur guards on, it's another crutch. Now when you get out, you don't feel you have the tactile sense, it's a great instrument to have in your arm and your But that's not what I want you to learn with. I want you to learn to control with your hands. I mean, you guys are dentists, you've got finite control to make a print within a millimeter. You just need to learn to control that with your own these implants. Down to 12 millimeters. It'll lift out of here. 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 Because, except for one case, because number one, I live in a rural community, my patients drive a long way to see me, and I don't want to come back to the suture. You're going to spend a little extra money in the program for the patient, you're going to like it. It's not as easy to handle for you, the practitioner, it's so it's much easier to handle. Silk is very caustic, and causes granulation, it causes tissue reaction. I use silk in my little sinuses. Or because I want that granulation tissue, I want that tissue to be an angry and grow fast. Especially the cosmetic zone, you don't want that. Okay? So learn, chromic suture is a little on you. It's not fun to handle. If you use it, it's more convenient for your patients, then it'll be more convenient for you. So, but today we're going to use silk. Now, let me see if I can put my manicure in the lingual. What I'm going to do, just to make it a little easier, some of these people, some people are having 
the hole from their implant get filled with some of the pieces of the label. So take your elevator, you can actually take the blade and make a couple of tiny little slits in that lingual flap and just put your elevator. Now when you're using an elevator on the lingual like this, a lot of you will just push on the tissue and what happens is you, boom, you're right into the submarine with space. Not good. You keep your elevator against the phone and then pull the tissue back. Keep your elevator against the phone and pull your tissues back. You always have a purchase for that elevator. Control it so you don't go slipping someplace you don't want to be. But I just released that label flap just a little bit because it's easier to sew or to get it out of the hole of your implant. Now, basic sewing 101, they want you to go from, from fixed tissue to, to loose tissue. That's great, and it works great, but it's another step. So we're going to put one stitch in one way and one stitch another way. We're going to put stitches in the corners. We're going to... We're going to go from the fixed tissue, which is the lingual, because it won't go anywhere. Now remember, your needle is curved. Every motion with your needle driver is a curved motion. Don't ever pull the straight. You're going to pull the stitch through the tissue. So we're going to push this, this, this through. And when we pull our needle through with the needle driver, we twist our wrist. Everything is curved. Every motion is curved when you sew. I'm going to, I have my tissue forces in, my, in this hand and I'm going to go through the periosteum and through the tissue. Curve motion. Alright, now every pack of suture has a number of zeros on it. Those zeros represent the number of knots you put in the suture. So if we got 4 of suture, I'm guessing it's 4 of like that. Yeah, this is four oh two. We're gonna put four knots in. So I go one, two, I go you can go forward or back, it doesn't matter. Yes, it's uh tight. That will lock it. Three that's number three. Well yeah, I'm a little curious. It looks like I might have hit the nerve. And it pulls through the four minutes. I think our models are actually slightly effective in that they're too sensitive because you you didn't hit the nerve because we've used the thirteen millimeter before on other models and maybe it's worked out fine. Because uh, you know, I I can't say that I look at my uh there and think it's malplaced, maybe it's a little bit. Um uh, you put the drill, how I'm sure that it was only because I'm from Mansfield, Texas, that I had to learn this, but Maybe you'll notice he doesn't grow the needle see that? Yeah. on the what? So you definitely hit right the on the end. Oh, yeah. yeah. But uh, I, so, I think you know, that uh, down, see what it is, is we, we give the faculty a uh, well, size that yeah. we've yeah. always yeah. used in the models in the past, and these are like too long for this additional model, so it's our fault. Well, I just want to make sure that the last I'll get down what he thinks of the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Because you're right, it, I, I don't want to say I felt a little uncomfortable, but I thought, you know, we should have an x-ray so I can so kind of confirm where in the heck I'm drilling. And I don't like that okay, first one that he kind of said. I've already done the mesial, I'm going to do the distal now. Hey, Chip. So I've got my... Needle driver, I've got my they were saying, would you say, I mean, that's showing the nerve there. Would you say my place When you're using needle drivers, you just use your fingers. Inaccurate? Like would you say I'm you too lingual? Would you say they were saying that maybe the, the implant is too long okay. for this model? And I know, Amy, you're left-handed, I'm left-handed. But we're using right-handed. I mean, if we go to the last. You learn how to do that. But you're using it upside down, so you lose control. And that's... Okay. <laughs> All right, I've got fingertips in the needle driver, and I've got Why my finger on the shaft short. of the needle driver, the lengthwise, okay? Yeah. So in which case, that, if that was the real world, that? what happens is the patient will right hand or left hand? How you, you get the there? Injury. So you just kind of when you get that, you kind of well, you control the tip with this finger hard again, okay. and you go. You control the rotation of the wrist, control the opening of the tips of your like a, almost like a force field. You've got to have full rotation in every direction. 
then you don't, so you don't carry the tissue. Right. You go to a 10. So if you grip the instrument, you lose rotation. I did that. Fingertips, fingertip points. Like okay. Uh, so you're not seeing anything other than what we talked about before about my well, more going from the lingual thing there yeah. in terms of positioning of that one. Now I'm actually yeah. going to use my retractor to hold the tissue. It's I've already not, got one stitch in. I don't need to use the tissue for it. My retractor will stabilize the tissue. Yeah. The more you do this, the more you learn efficiency in yeah, fewer steps. And you think about what we've done here, this is real this time. We've got a cadaver I actually, here. We've got a in five that, minutes. That, it, That's real time. That's what it takes. Okay. Cause, cause well, everything we see on So this. we're going to do two knots. We we're going to lock it. That. Okay. We're going to do one knot. You're, you're not long. And then yeah, one knot the other probably way. Probably, what, 12 and three quarters now, there? Now, putting this in now. Four throws total. We got it. we got a millimeter of play now. Yeah. All you need is two sutures here, one on each corner, and that gets you flat closed. People say, what about the releasing incisions? The releasing incisions are bent. If this guy's bleeding like crazy, you want to bend. You don't want to sew it up tight. You want it to bend. You don't want it to swell. The releasing incisions are your vents. When I do a third molar, I put one stitch in. I leave everything else open so it vents pressure. That's what we're doing here. All right, try that. <laughs> what do you say? Take it down about halfway, then take the. Uh, no, a little more until you see about just a couple threads. That's good. Stop. Okay. Then we'll take that on. And that's uh, short one. one. Yeah, it's very short. It's, it's always back. good when they don't. To the large, so the 6 0 is the only, this is the only driving system for the 6 0. Everything else is off of this. Everything else is off of this. Yes, thank you. Sure. So you see, is so about you see that? two millimeters above the press there. Keep going. Keep going. Right, about two millimeters in width there. Oh, I should. Can go down more. Why don't we see if you can get the threads threads under? It's not an aesthetic zone, so no, far. No, no, exactly. Right. So I'd rather go with the, the increase um, strength on this. Now your healing cap is in here. Yep. Yeah, put it and then just drag it to the side and it pops up. Right. These are, uh, these clips are getting worn on these. But they snap right in. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't hesitate. Maybe this makes it easier. I've had no bone loss on that. One nice thing, we don't have to have a plastic suture. Plastic surgery closure. Nice we just want to get that cover nice that up, and then your then mouth has an amazing ability to heal, so it doesn't have to be exactly okay. approximately. Okay, that's a good learning experience. <laughs> yeah, what do you get when you didn't get what you wanted? <laughs> now, I have a red light there. 
You know, it's, if you have space in a patient's cooperative, you can do a lot of things. It's one of those situations where if they're not, <laughs> you can't do anything. Or darn little. Okay, sutures. Jim and I were talking. You said, you know, normally I go from the uh, attached uh, tissue to the unattached. And you, and that's correct. That's that's a good way. It's not as fast, that's right? Correct. Well, it's just the other is a little bit like you know catching a grease pig. Right. That is the correct way to do it. I, I and I, I don't I don't do it that way anymore. You know, just because of speed. Right. Well, but, uh, that is the correct way to do it. What do you think of that book that they're always pushing about suturing from uh, all those guys named Silverstein? Is that a help or is that just more than what we need to be doing? Well, that's probably more than we need to do. Uh, Periodons like to do all kinds of fancy. Uh, right. Well, they're, you know, they're, they're gum gardeners. They're plastic surgeons. And oh, yeah. Well, I would tell you, I've seen some of those things. Cases come back, you look at that, and you say, oh, my God, that, that, that seamstress mark. Right. Guess. They do beautiful sewing. Oh, yeah. Time you can practice more sutures in this wound, it won't hurt a thing. Yeah. 
Some of you have CO2 lasers. That that's another way to do it. Um, in my practice, that's what I'd use and, and, and do it that way. Um, so you can see here again. You can do a reflection, or in this case, do the punch. And this is second stage. Now, a lot of times, if we can avoid second stage, it's nice because you can you know move right along. Uh, however, if you can't visualize the bone, then flat. David, you said you flap a lot? You don't flop, right? You flap. Okay. So here's the uh, same thing. And a lot of times, it, it, we, won't, we, we won't have you flap this. We'll just see if you can uh, go ahead and punch through and, and, and do that. It's a simple technique. And then take the impression. Because uh, usually second stage like this, they're coming back. You're going to locate it. Take the ceiling cap off. Go ahead, put your transfer uh, uh, fixture on there, take the impression this afternoon, and put the healing collar back on. And then they're back in about four weeks for your final final restoration. All right? So let's look at a case, an actual case. All right? <laughs> Okay, so look at the actual case. Number 13, all right? Uh, we're using a punch technique with uh, CO2. All right, this, the Zimmer kit does have this, this little um, uh, uh, kit here. So you don't, a lot of times, what I do with these big kits is a lot of times the 6.0 drill set is not in here. <coughs> The 6-0 drill set is not in here. I don't use it that often, right? So we keep it in a little pack like this one because every time you sterilize this prawn over and over and over, Jim, what happens? It dolls. Yeah, they doll, and you just wasted money on that. So pull those out. You're going to play a lot of plays between the 3-7 and the 4-7 implant system. So you can have this kind of preset if you want. Uh, so we go through the process. Here's the uh, the calibrations again. All right, you guys got that down? It's important. Now, if you know the implant ahead of time, most of you have digital x-ray? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Do you use the measure tool? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Start using that. Yeah, that's for bone. Yet when we go into the tissue, you have to remeasure, Jeff, what's the tissue collar? and add the mat to the burp. So, go through the process here. All right, here's the implant site. Now, you notice, uh, you notice the, the guide pin. What direction am I, do I need to correct to? You just took your film, Alan. You look in there and you see, and it's not wobbly, it's in there pretty tight, your guide pin. Okay. James, you see it? Which direction do I want to correct? I want to tip more mesial. Everyone understand that? Yeah, tip it just mesial because you can see my direction is looking not bad at the apical, yet at the uh, crestal part, I'm too close to the molar, aren't I? So these are places where you can make those corrections, and this is where you need to make the correction. If you keep going forward to the last part, you're going to be off, and then, like Bill said, and I've done it too, I've tagged, I've run off the side of a roof, okay? It, it's going to happen. If you don't stop, you don't take the pictures, okay? Now, 
here's the drill. You can use the drill now as the calibrator because it is the, the marks you're going to be in. So now you can see that. See that, Jose? You can see the actual marks. You can count them. Where am I at? Count it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Eight, I'm, I'm buried ten, below which mark? Ten? No. Yep. Somewhere between ten and eleven and a half. One, two, yep. Okay. So, and let's go back. Now, what other anatomical feature am I concerned about? Sinus. Okay. So, if I, on there, Jen, if I took my measuring tool on my digital x ray, how much more? Yeah. One to two. Sure. Absolutely. So if we got ten there now, Sterling, I can go to probably eleven and a half, right? Yeah. So I want to go to eleven and a half. Okay. Even if I pop into the sinus, I'm okay. I'm all right. We're gonna we're gonna solve that problem for you, Jeremy. <laughs> okay. So we do. We go a little more. with the 4-1. When this snaps in, because these kits get used so often, that little snap in it isn't as nice as the ones that will be in your practice. I mean, mine are still, after all these years, snapping in. Um, so it snaps in, and you pull it right out of the carrier. One thing, though, I do have my assistants, too. So assistants who are in the room, I want you, before you crack open that bottle, you look at the doctor, eye to eye, That's and you say... Amazing. Four one by eleven and a half. And they look at you and go, yes. What does that help you do, Sharon? Save money. You picked the right one, right? So she can't, or she or he can't look at you and go, no, you took the wrong one. Stupid right? son of a gun. So yeah, so King, have them talk to you, look at you in the eye, right? Just don't let them pull that on you, okay? Pull it out, because once you crack this thing open, it you bought it. Even though the zimmer's pretty nice, but in my opinion, you bought it. So it comes out, and you start driving it in. And it's one thing that you're, I don't know, did anyone, as they were driving it, did you get any little freak, freak, freak feeling? Yeah, in the mouth. It's really like that, huh, King? I mean, it's like, <coughs> If you, if you try to keep going with the transfer coping here, driving it at that torque, Jeff, you're gonna have a, it's going to lock on there. If it does, you just back out the set screw, grab it with hemostats, and wiggle, 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 and it'll come out. Yet, what I want, when those who I came around with, I, I had to stop just as you got to the last thread. Take this off while it's still not torqued down. It comes off pretty easily. Go to the large driver that goes directly into the implant. And you have much, much more control of that. And you can sense that. You can feel it. Okay? So we drive it in. Take that off. Okay? There's the large driver. Go directly into it. And that's one thing I really love about the machining of these cars. They click in. you got total control. So that's a nice, that's a nice result. And now we can measure the collar. So you measure the collar, K. It's three millimeters. What do you tell your assistant what what um, healing cap, cap do you want? Three millimeters. Five or three? Three. Yeah. And you can go five, but three, three is pretty ideal. You keep it keep it kind of flush. There's the healing the healing cap. And there it is. Torqued in. And it's finger tight. It should be tight, tight. Finger tight. In. Because sometimes these things pin back out. There's the implant. We make our corrections. I'm right there at the top of the crest. And the healing top. Patient's back now. We take this off. This is what we're going to do this afternoon. Okay, we're going to pretend. It's ready. It's three months later. We're going to take this off. We can use, and in this case, we don't have to do a punch, but this is what Ross does for us at Arrowhead. He's the master of creating. Any, any angulation changes, he'll correct for us. Get the abutment, we're going to drive it in, right? And then the cap here. Now, one step we didn't do or show is just the uh, impression part. 
but we'll go through this part this afternoon. There's the finished. Now, if you look at that x-ray, you'll notice there's a little pinch in. You notice the little pinch in? Um, uh, uh, that's, that is a, a nice feature on this system that gives us that tissue volume right around the neck of that implant where we want to really be a gasket around it. So it works really well. And you get some really good tissue results with that. I was talking to some of you earlier, and I wanted to address this so we, we can move on from this, about the tissue in the, in the bone dieback. On the right, what system is that? Ankylos. The ankylos. On the left is a zimmer. So I had fun here. <laughs> Trying to get rid of my ankles. No. <laughs> but I wanted to see, right? And because I, I, I really I really see the value with the bone height, yet here's here's something that's pretty impressive. Now, let me ask you, doctors. Okay, Philip. Look at the ankylos diameter of the abutment and the zimmer. What do you see? Weakness. Yeah. And it's got an internal taper. So the platform strength is where we're having, I'm having issues with this other system and they're breaking. If you've had them in for about four to five years and you haven't had any break, get ready. <laughs> it's going to come. And they're going to be in the posteriors. And they're always on the number first molars and you probably put in a A11. Right, John? So look at the interface here and you can look how nice the bone is on both of those. This is where we get problems. See that one there? See how, see how um, we have to cantilever up to the next tooth? This is what I'm talking about, Tristan. See how how we got bone accelerating up to the distal of the bicuspid, and you have to stretch. Actually, Ross has to stretch that up there, and that's where these things break. Okay, that's where I've had issues with that. So there it is, it broke, and you can see how that wall is coming up. Now, if you have flared abutments or a flared uh, feeling collar put in. I will tell you, Dale, you're probably going to be whacking into the to that ridge there and not know it. And as you screw it down, you're wedging into that wall that's accelerating up to the next tooth, and you're creating a reverse pull now on the implant. So if you see that, you're going to have to go through more of a cylinder feeling cap, a cylinder, so you don't put that pressure there, or a longer one, like a five millimeter. So these, 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 these contracts. So in this guy's case, see, I had nothing, I couldn't do anything in this case. But one thing I learned from Bill was this. And I think I've sold more implants because of this. Um, Is that uh, this guy, right? You look, he's missing two teeth. I said to him, well, we can just put one, we'll be fine, right? No. Who's, who's talking? He's that little guy in the back of my head. I can't sell two, and he won't buy, but he'll buy one, I can do one, and he'll like me. That's that approval addiction, right? Yeah. So, you know, I listen to Bill, and he's up there in, in Scott's Bluff, you know, Put and three. he's putting them in cows and everything. And that's the truth, I'll tell you the story. You thought I was lying, huh? So, Betsy, no, anyway. Uh, so, what I learned from Bill was, you know what, hey, listen, you already got it, you got the patient, now I'm Alan, right? Right, Jen? They, they, they committed to that. So, why don't you just sell them another one for, for a third off? To say, hey, you know what, since I'm in there, and, and really, Mrs. Jones, the best thing is to hear is to give the most strength here in the back here. Because you're a cow chewer. That might be the case, right? Yet, I'll, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to give you a cost savings. Not a discount, Mike. A cost savings. Remember that word? Cost savings, Jose. Not discount. Never discount your work. Cost savings. I'm going to give you a cost savings, Neil. And I'm going to put that other one in 
for uh, 1200 instead of 1800 Oh, that's really great, yeah. Yeah, and this is the thing, the lesson I learned. Double butt. Over-engineer it. And that's a guy who told me that years ago. So these are six O's. So I took that one out using that piezo <coughs> instrumentation, took that out, put this one in immediately, and put another one in behind. And what I want to show you, see, is look how I propped it up here. If I try to go to the cortical plate here on the first one, see I'm there, but on the back side I'm not. It's not a perfect world. And that's the thing I love about this system. It gives me that variation of about a millimeter to play with. And if I get close to the IA there, I can back it out, David. <laughs> okay? I can pull it up. So I prop that's work that's exactly what you did, and you're you'll be away from danger. Okay? Nothing wrong with that. Two minutes. So here it is. We, we uncover because uh, on the first one, on the first one, I buried it. So I used this healing cap. Second one, I, I, I went in, put my healing cap. But I want to draw your attention to the healing collar, to your ankylos people particularly. Because you heard that story. Look how beautiful that is. We're getting the same thing. And, Philip, a much bigger platform to come from. And that, look at that tissue. It's just fantastic. Okay? Ross made me the same things. I use these when I parallel and, or when I uh, uh, splint these together, Jeremy. Crank these out, torque them. Okay? Philip, you like those? Okay? Not over. And I'll tell you what. I've been going back to this because I don't want to have to take this off. So guess what I'm doing? Metal occlusals. They're cemented down, but metal occlusal in the posterior. Metal stops, door stop. Boom. Right? You've heard me talk about second molar. Stops. I, I've kind of gotten back to this because I see my cases now 20 years. And the ones that are surviving are the ones with the metal second molar stops. This is a guy. He could care less. He just wants to eat and chew his hamburgers, hot dogs, blah, 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 stuff, you know? And so here's here's how it all looks. And look at the beauty on that, Philip. I'm sold. I'm sold. Give him a water pick and he does great. Okay? That's now, see how I have to accelerate up to the next tooth to make the distal contact to the bite? You think I have more strength there now? I can withstand this guy's bite. Okay. And what else do you see? This is a this is an X-ray that we always take before we let the patient leave after cementation. Okay. Do you see it? No cement. Look at the mesial, the first uh, number nineteen. Do you see cement? Eighty-one percent of our failures are because we leave retained cement. Implantitis is because we're leaving retained cement. So doctors, you should always take this picture. It'll save you so much. Yeah, and, and, and remember that. And like, um, you know, we gotta learn from our mistakes. But um, most of you aren't gonna live long enough to make enough mistakes to uh, really learn them. So. Some of us that have done this a lot longer, learn from our mistakes, it will save you uh, a lot of trouble. But that cement is so important, and, and if, if you miss it on the x-ray, if they come back in a week and that tissue is the least bit irritated, you better take another x-ray, because I guarantee you there is cement there. Lost your power. Yeah, what's your thoughts on just on just putting just enough cement? I mean, so that it doesn't squish out. I mean, if you're just putting just a slight amount, you tell the patient, you know, there may be a slight chance that this could come off, but I'd rather have it come off than squish out and miss cement. Yeah, great question. Uh, so in our practice, uh, we call it streaking the interior. Uh -huh. So when we put the cement into the interior, uh, 
you know, before you, you try and fill that and even maybe two thirds of it, and you push it down, and you see it pop up, right? It's like, you know, pop it down, it'll pop up. There's nowhere for it to go. So, what you want to do is we use uh, a, a Peru probe. So, they'll mix the cement and pick it up with the probe and run it inside and just swirl it. And then just run a bead around the margin. And then when you push it down, you hardly get anything out. Hardly anything. And, and, and some guys actually have abutments. They have abutments uh, that they keep. And it may be, um, you know, like on the stock one. It has to be a stock. But they'll run it down the stock one and it spreads it out. And they'll have that film layer inside and put it on that one. So if you do stock, um, not, not too often I'm doing stock. Yeah, vent holes. Jeff, yeah. you had a quick question? My question is, you yeah. got for about three years old now. Yeah. Because I've never done water in Yeah. I, I'm still staying in the cement hole. Um, I've just learned not to load that thing. You, you do that swirl technique and just run it around. And it's not a lot in there, and you have to train your system. So. After I have them, I look at it, I go, take more out. And they have to take a lot out. It's not a lot. It's a streaking fashion. They'll streak it around, and then just, you'll see streaks of it. But then always put that bead around the margin. What are you using there? For cement? Right now on the uh, PFMs, uh, it's going to be a glass on it. So, good IX. thing we didn't do we're supposed to do we're supposed to give you a disclaimer in the beginning of the talk uh, John and Jim and I are employed by Arrowhead we have no affiliation with Zimmer whatsoever so, I mean I've used Zimmer since the day they came out but uh, as far as that's it I didn't even put a the problem. I thought we got three Starbucks for life <laughs> oh sorry Dr. Downs. Hey, uh, so lunch will be ready after the tour. So if you guys can follow Sean and uh, Doug downstairs, they'll go ahead and start the tour process. So thank you.